Good morning, everyone. My name is Yvette Jones. I am the Chief Communications Officer here in Douglas County. And beside me is uh, Vice Chair and District 4 Commissioner Mark Alcarez. We thank you for being here. Wanted to start off with by saying that May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And there is lots for us to zero in on and talk about during this very uh, important month of awareness. And I want to applaud uh, our Vice Chair Alcarez for for wanting to pull together this forum, this conversation, particularly with our first responders. Um, Vice Chair Alcarez, tell me a little bit of why um, you wanted to have this forum, this discussion. Well, when we started talking about Mental Health Awareness Month, being having worked alongside by side with public, a lot of those uh, in, in this room, and it's gonna be on this forum today in public safety, there's a lot that we don't talk about there's a lot that people do not know in regards to the pressures that each one of our departments go through, our deputies, our fire EMS, uh, all the way down to our coroner's office, our 911, uh, animal control. And so we got to looking at this and looking at the, and the statistics of mental health and what each one of their departments go through, roughly about you know one third of our public safety, our deputies, experience some sort of mental health about 20 percent from our fire and ems and we get to looking about or thinking about well what do we do how does this manifest what can we do to help them in each one of their departments because you know a lot of people don't think about animal control but when you go out there and you see these cruelty to these animals on a daily basis and what they're doing or what people are doing to these animals it affects those, especially those who really care a lot for animals. And then we got, got to thinking about, you know, our corner. Mm -hmm. All they see is death on a daily basis. Our 911 dispatchers, they have to sit and listen to a lot of horrific phone calls that come over. Because those sometimes when you call 911, you're at a time of need. Then you have our fire name mess and you have our sheriff's department and our police department who show up at these scenes and what they have to go through to not only, you know, help out at that situation or on that call, but also they experience death a lot of times. So we got to looking at this and thought, well, what can we do? Can we, I would like to put, now I thought, you know what, and our great staff come together and said, let's do a forum so that our county understands sometimes what is not talked about and what is behind the scenes and what each department goes through. So I thought it was important to put this together for everyone and I'm thankful for every one of you who showed up today for your department and we'll be speaking about this uh, a little later on as we go through this panel. Absolutely, and we will have uh, three separate panel discussions today, and I wanted to start with sort of a broader look at this discussion, and so assembled uh, over to my left um, is a panel of uh, experts in this arena um, who can talk about various uh, aspects of this, uh, from legislation to um, how to deal and cope with some of these very pressing issues. So I'd like to first uh, introduce Corey Thomas, who is a military combat veteran who served for 23 years specializing in strategic planning, personnel management, purpose development, and business management. He is president and CEO of Strataplan and What Next University. He's also co-founder of Veterans Molding Minds. Upon his retirement from the military, he has helped develop 15 startup businesses throughout his journey. Since 2017, Mr. Thomas has trained over 1,500 youth, at-risk youth, and returning citizens to the Atlanta metro area. Of that number, he has secured employment for over 90% of students graduating vocational training programs affiliated with his organization. His new mission in life is helping people understand their purpose and to develop pathways to their career destination. We also have Sakina Huffman, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist who began her career in mental health over 10 years ago. Her journey started with assisting a family member cope with postpartum depression and divorce. 
Her motivation and passion is helping people who are struggling with mood disorders, behavioral disorders, depression, family conflict, self-esteem, and other challenges to mental well-being. In her practice, she utilizes cognitive behavioral therapy, solution-focused therapy, and motivational interviewing to affect thought processes and behaviors. Ms. Huffman works with Families First, whose mission is to improve the outcomes for families who have complex challenges. And Tiffany Stewart Stanley is the Chief of Staff and Assistant County Administrator for Douglas County. She is a certified public manager and an attorney who serves as the county's official lobbyist. Tiffany is a magnum cum laude graduate of Alcorn State University, the University of Mississippi School of Law, and is a member of the State Bar of Georgia. Tiffany serves on the Board of Directors for the National Association of Counties and as President of the National Association of County Intergovernmental Relations Officials. She was awarded the Douglas County Community Services Board Community Leadership Award in 2021 and is also a graduate of the Leadership Georgia class of 2022. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being a part of this panel. So let's start, uh, I would say, with, with an acronym many of us have heard, and some of us know what, what it means, but I'd like to take a deeper dive into it. PTSD. I'll start with our therapist. What is PTSD? Okay, PTSD stands for Post Traumatic Stress Disorder. Um, and actually, PTSD did not become a actual diagnosis that was recognized in the DSM, which is our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders until 1980. And so talk a little bit about um, how do we recognize it? What are some of the common uh, symptoms and can it cause physical symptoms? Absolutely. Um, so some of the common symptoms are severe anxiety, um, increased depression, withdrawals, isolation, um, nightmares or flashbacks about the traumatic event. Um, yes, you can have some physical um, symptoms that relate to PTSD, such as headaches, feeling fatigue, chest pains, like you're having a heart attack, and digestive issues. Mr. Thomas, I want to talk with you a little bit about PTSD. Um, you've noted to us that it has impacted your life and your career in some ways. Will you talk about that, share that experience? Um, yes. Um, like you said, 23 years in the military, um, but I kind of fast forward to 2005, um, my first tour to Iraq. Um, and as I actually got on ground in Iraq, you know, we were taught as soon as we arrive that everybody is a threat. Everyone around you is a threat. And so you started to develop a sense of numbness from just interacting with the individuals, looking into their eyes and, and seeing, it, it was almost like you were, you started to see death. And as we lost, um, the first week we lost five soldiers, our first week there, and um, going to the funeral and um, just really thinking about, man, I just had breakfast with this person this morning and now this afternoon I'm having a funeral. And doing that over and over and over um, I really started wondering, what was my purpose? Why, why am I here? What, what's happening in my life right now? And now I take it to as I started to transition home, because that's where you really start to understand how it affects you. Um, there's these things called invisible wounds when you have pride. These invisible wounds they really tear you up from the inside out and you don't see it coming. Um, you start to, you know, I, I was married. Three months after I returned home, for the first 30 days, I did nothing but sit on the couch and drink myself till I actually passed out. And what I learned about once you pass out, if you're having any type of conversation prior to that, you could go into a, a phase where you black out and you really don't understand what's happening around you. And um, once you hit that blackout phase, you really you could actually come back, you know, come back to reality as if nothing happened. Um, and I went through that multiple times, really not understanding what was happening until um, one night, you know, me and my, my wife got into it, and um, I realized that 
I was going to beat her until she told me what I wanted to hear. And it was almost like a flashback of things that I saw when we were in Iraq. If you wanted information, you knew how to get the information. And so as I went through that process with her and uh, I was severely intoxicated, um, when I came back to and, and realized what I had done, um, I disappeared. I just disappeared for about, really about 30 days, and um, I never went back to our house again. I had just had a newborn baby, um, and I did not know what to do because my pride was really um, interfering with how are people in the military going to look at me now? And I was, you know, for that event right there, that's just one of them, but for that event, I was really happy that, you know, she didn't go and tell the police or anything. Um, her, her father, they, they covered it up. And um, it really started eating at me, like something's wrong. And I'm not understanding what it is. So from there, um, I moved out. I was actually out and about, um, staying in a, a, a hotel. I remember staying in a hotel for about, it was one of these extended stays. And it was like, this was just my place of peace. I didn't have to interact with anyone. I didn't have to talk to anyone. Um, and it was weird because I didn't even have to drink during that time. I don't, I don't know what happened, but I, I didn't have not one drink while I was actually in the extended stay. And, and trying to figure out what is my next move. And I remember going back to work and act as, acting as if nothing had happened. And I started hearing soldiers talking about the same thing, some of the things that they were experiencing. And I'm saying to myself, wow, what they're going through is exactly what I just went through. And, um, and so I said, man, I, need to, I, I really need to get some help. I need to reach out to, to someone and get some help you know, and help me understand what's happening because I couldn't figure it out. Um, it was just that, that place to where you get lonely, but at the same time, you want company. Um, when she started talking about the physical effects, the headaches that comes with it are very, very severe. The anxiety, the, the, the nervous feeling that you have when you start to to really get into reality or, or really just life. And now I'm fast forwarding a little bit more to how this affected me because in the military, I started getting comfortable in the military. It was like, hey man, we all been through it. We all were talking about it, it was fun, you know, and, and, and we made fun of stuff that was so serious, it was ridiculous. And that's where that numbness came in because we didn't know. That's, that's the way the military had, had really um, programmed us to, to really understand we had a mission and, and this comes along with the mission. You just had to do it. So, fast forward to me getting out of the military. Here it is, three divorces and um, I'm now saying, okay, I think I'm the problem. What is, what's happening? The alcohol, it never stopped. Um, you can mask it. Yeah, we're just hanging out with the buddies, but nah, when you're drinking and, and you're getting so drunk to where you're still having these blackouts, uh, it tends to, to really disrupt your life. The not coming home um, some nights, waking up in your car, you know, on the, the side of the road, just kind of going through the motions and, and wondering, oh man, I'm glad I made it this far. At least I, I can make it to have another drink. Um, all this stuff just became normal, all right? And um, I went from physical abuse to verbal abuse, which some people tell you that's a little bit worse. And remember, I'm talking about these invisible wounds. I'm still not understanding what's happening. Even though people are talking to me about, you, got, you may have PTSD, it doesn't register when you have a certain position, and especially when you have a position of authority. When you're in these high-ranking positions, you will lose yourself into your position or your rank. That's just what it is. And you mask everything with your position or your title. So here I go, um, transitioning out. 
I, I remember getting fired from my first job. Um, and as I got fired from that job, I said, um, I want to invest in myself. The AAs, the, um, those sessions, they didn't work for me because I didn't take it serious. Um, those um, support groups, they didn't work because you don't take it serious. I, and I felt like everyone in those support groups were really just coming in to tell their story and everybody's trying to tell um, a better story than the next person. So as I pushed past that, I took a course called Neuro Linguistic Programming. And it taught me how the subconscious has a lot of stored memories there that has, um, and, and traumatic events that I had not resolved. Some of them can start from when you were a kid and some just happens when you go through these traumatic events as I'm um, going through the military and seeing some of the things that you see. So I took this course and um, I said, wow, there are some things there that I've suppressed for so long that I've really never wanted to give any attention to. And, um, and I realized going through that course, they allowed me the space to give some attention to those areas that's very scary to go into, that's very scary to, to really touch on. And um, I was able to open up, and I remember my breakthrough like it was yesterday. I remember tears coming down my eyes, and I said, man, I figured it out. Now what's the next step? Understanding my new purpose in life. Some of us live in our career, which is what we call an institutional purpose, but we never really understand who you are and what your individual purpose is in life. And when I say go back to the invisible wounds, you can mask it, you can run from it all you want, but it's gonna hit you. And you, you know, some of us are lucky enough to maybe not go to prison or not be killed in the process and make it through it, and some of us are not. So I say, you know, to anyone, watch for the invisible wounds. Look for the things that you're not looking for. When you see yourself separating yourself for too long, because a day can end up a month real quick, and you really don't realize how fast it happens, check yourself. And if you really need some assistance, we, we're putting things in place because a lot of the traditional programs, they're not as effective as they used to be because people have learned how to manipulate these programs, okay? So you gotta try a new technique. And, um, and for some of us, some of these techniques are very, very costly to learn. I mean, it costs a lot. I think I spent, going out after the military, I spent about close to $60,000 in um, character development courses and, and really purpose development courses to really understand who Corey Thomas was and why was Corey Thomas acting the way he was and, and how to now um, build a new pathway to whatever my career destination or just my life destination would be. So um, I will say to everyone, when your body starts to change and when you feel a certain type of way or anxiety is happening just too often, you really need to reach out to some of these, some, some of our support groups, and, and I'm saying with some of the support groups that we're initiating, talk to us and let us try to do an assessment to see which direction to guide you because, like I said, some of the traditional courses, they're just not as effective as they used to be. And, um, and just giving my testimony of how, you know, to open your mind up and, and get into a, a growth mindset and saying, Maybe there is something wrong with me. I think that would help you out a lot. Uh, I hope I didn't go too far, too long. I, I have to say, I mean, it's truly a testimony, and it, it, it was riveting. It was riveting. And I think, um, you know, have, what you've lived through um, and what you've come through to, to come towards your purpose will be uh, a help to people who are listening, um, who are watching. Thank you for sharing your story. You're um, 
Ms. Huffman, as we, as we I heard lots of nuggets there, right? Mm -hmm. um, lots of, lots of um, revelations in terms of trying to understand what was wrong. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, you know, I mean, and everybody's path and journey is different. Absolutely. How, what, what therapies, what assistance is available to people um, who may not be as enlightened on their journey as Mr. Thomas is? Um, how can we help them? Absolutely. Um, there's different avenues you can take. It depends on what um, fits your lifestyle. Um, like Mr. Thomas said, there are support groups. Um, being around other people who are going through what you experience helps because you know you're not the only one. Mm -hmm. um, However, you also can do um, psychiatry because it depends on the severity of your PTSD. Sometimes medication is needed to help level you out, to get that clear mind, to help you get to the next step so you can get the help. So you can always see your psychiatrist for different medication management um, techniques they may have. And then, of course, you have talk therapy. Any licensed mental health therapist can assist with PTSD. We're all trained. We've all gone through, of course, the schooling to help, but sitting and talking and being able to help you put those pieces together through therapy and give you the coping skills that are needed is something that is going to be long lasting because medication is temporary. Um, and then of course we also have what we call certified peer specialists and we do have peer specialists that um, specialize in PTSD that have gone through um, either combat zones or being first responders and they're now in the mental health field and they're um, there to help and assist individuals who are seeking assistance for PTSD, so there's several avenues. I'd like to bring um, ACA Tiffany Stewart Stanley into this conversation. We, we talked about your role in being a lobbyist on behalf of the county. Um, the, the state legislature has recognized this as an important issue um, worth creating awareness around and worth um, investing in. Can you talk to us a little bit about what is happening on the state level? I believe there is a House Bill 451 that was just passed uh, last week. Yes. So on the state level in the past, I would say three or four years, there's been a greater shift towards recognizing um, what our public safety officials um, go through here in our state. One of the things that one of the first big bills was the cancer insurance bill for firefighters that was passed about three or four years that um, one of our local state representatives, Michael Gravely, um, championed. And we've seen a, um, a shift towards really trying to make a focus on what you all go through as public safety individuals. Um, House Bill 451, this bill was actually conceptualized about three years ago. Um, this comes from there is an, actually an advocate, her name is Ashley Wilson, she's a sergeant in Gwinnett County, and in 2018 she watched her partner die in her arms. You know, just imagine a co-worker dying in your arms, and she watched her partner die in her arms. Um, and so of course she developed PTSD from this. When she developed PTSD, she amassed a lot of medical bills, about $20,000 in medical bills that she did not get coverage for. So she had to pay these bills as well as go back to work and deal with this traumatic situation. So she decided to go to the General Assembly and try to get someone to help her with this task of pushing this bill. So the bill was first, um, I believe, um, introduced back in 2022, and it's taken three years to get the bill passed. Um, one of the things I'll tell anybody when you want a bill passed at the state legislation, find an advocate who can empathize with you. And so she found a licensed uh, EMT, who is now an ambulance co um, company executive, but he, is, he knows what you know, she's gone through because he was a paramedic. So Representative Seabaugh out of Marietta sponsored this bill, and this year the bill was able to be passed. And what the bill essentially does is it requires um, local governments to provide uh, disability insurance uh, for um, first responders who go through traumatic situations. Um, it just mandates that public entities must offer supplemental insurance um, to specific first responders diagnosed in occupational PTSD. So there has to be a diagnosis, um, and that diagnosis cannot be prior to July 1st, 2024. So the bill will go in, it actually will go into effect on January 1st of 2025, but you could be diagnosed as early as July 
1st of 2024. Um, and what the bill does, it provides a one-time lifetime payment of $3,000, as well as up to three months of um, disability insurance, not to exceed $5,000. Now, the original intent was to be more. It was, a, it was supposed to be $10,000. But as you know, at the state legislature, there has to be a lot of compromising, sometimes in order to get a bill passed. Um, but that is the essence of the bill, and the bill was signed into law by the governor on May 1st of this year. So I'd like to circle back to uh, Mr. Thomas on this. You hear this 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 movement. Um, would this have been something that would have helped you? Um, yes, I think it could have helped um, because awareness um, is everything. And but I feel that certain times when you start to shut down and you really don't want to interact with people or you really are not um, in the right, um, I would say, areas that who, who really have true um, outreach, um, you know, partners, it'll be, it'll be very difficult to, to find us because a lot of times you just, don't want anybody to know how abusive you are or how damaged you are. Um, it, it was a pride thing, and um, you shut down all any any type of information that you think, um, especially when it comes to <laughs> politics. You 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 neutralize your thought process, and, and so. You just have to have like, and I think um, Sakina said it right, sometimes you just got to have the right person that's next to you to really be able to, to connect with you and build a, a strong rapport with you to um, make you aware of that information. And speaking of information, uh, are there resources the county provides in this arena? So right now, the county, we have our employee assistance program, which is a program that any of our employees can take um, um, advantage of that provides some um, mental health services for themselves or an immediate family member. Those are the, that's what we have right now, but we are looking to do some things to expound those um, services. Um, one thing is under our Operation Greenlight, we're looking to provide more resources for our veterans and our first responders in our county. Um, and Operation Greenlight is something that the National Association of Counties is promoting to help promote veterans and resources um, in our community. So we are looking definitely to go delve, delve further into that arena and provide more resources. I think one of the biggest things is taking away the stigma, mm -hmm. right, of um, knowing that it's okay to have the conversation, mm -hmm. knowing that it's okay to reach out, knowing that you are not the only one in that situation. Um, Vice Chair, any thoughts on this before we wrap this panel? No, but just some of those things you, you, you spoke about as uh, Ms. Thomas said, you talked about, you know, it is that stigma. It is, it is that you don't want people to know what's going on. There's a lot that goes on behind a lot of closed doors that a lot of people don't know about. Mm -hmm. And it's tough. But I want to ask this for our therapists is, is with that stigma, for those who don't know, and so they would feel more comfortable about this, what type of protections are those for those who do, do come and ask for help but don't want people to know about it? Oh, well, you know, we, we all have our HIPAA rights. So mm -hmm. if you go to a therapist, it's not like they can um, call your you know, direct command or re report to your supervisor that, hey, by the way, your employee came in today to talk about, you know. Um, so it is between you and your therapist um, when you go to a therapist. Um, and when it comes to stigma, it's a stigma because we want to keep it a secret. You know, when you go through something mentally, um, it's just something you're going through. It's not something that you should be ashamed of. I mean, most of us, if we get a cold, I have a cold right now, um, we're not ashamed to say it. I have a cold. I don't feel good. It's fine. Um, but for most people, when it comes to your mental stability, you don't want to say, hey, today is not a good day. Today, my anxiety is up. Today, I'm feeling a little bit more sadder than usual. I'm feeling a little bit more frustrated or irritated than usual because we believe people are going to look at us like, oh, you can't handle your position or you can't handle, you know, doing whatever your job requires you to do. And that's not always true. You know, we all have a breaking point at some place. And just because you're having those, you know, feelings or you're going through those things, it does not mean that you should be ashamed of it. 
So, you know, when it comes to wanting to have your privacy, I mean, just like when you go to your doctor, nobody knows why you go. Same thing with your mental health. That's what HIPAA is for. But for you, you have to stand up and also say, you know, it's going to be what it's going to be. You know, I didn't ask. Nobody wakes up and say, you know, hey, today I want to be depressed. You, no, we don't ask for it. It happens, but we don't ask. So, you know, stumping out the stigma starts with you being okay with being where you are in life. Mr. Thomas, have another thought? Yes. <clears throat> Career-wise, it could be damaging. The truth of it is it can be damaging to a lot of people career-wise. Once someone realizes that you have a, a true mental health or behavioral health issue, the talk starts to happen. And, and when you start looking at position of hire, you will be judged. And it's judged, you're being judged because of the safety of the other people around you for one reason. But at the same time, um, you really have to, and, and I would say this to anyone that's going through this, like Sakina said, you really do have to be honest with yourself. Because there's no, there's no point when you can say, I push myself to the limit. Your body will shut down on you. Once your body shuts down, you're not in control of what happens then. So I'm, I'm, I'm an advocate for saying, sometimes, you know, based on who you are, you may have to look at your career and say, I may have to go into a new career field. I don't care how hard you work throughout your life for that position, but it will affect your job in some type of way. And it's going to come out. So you can, you can run from it all you want and, and try to make it up the ranks because this is part of who you, you planned on being in life, career-wise. But I tell you, it's going to come out. And once it comes out, you're not going to be in control of it. Let me, as we begin to wrap this panel up, um, some people may be dealing with you know, levels of stress that perhaps don't rise to the level of a PTSD diagnosis. Um, but some days are harder than other, others. Um, are there some coping mechanisms um, that we can employ along the way that kind of help us mitigate some of those feelings so that it, it, you know, we don't get to the level where we, we, we rise to a diagnosis? Oh, yes. Um, there are always coping skills for everything. Um, I love coping skills. Um, first, just, you know, like, Mr. Thomas and I have been saying, you have to be honest with yourself. So you have to know you, you know, because we all on some level deal with some level of anxiety or depression, not to the level of concern, but we have those days. Um, so you have to be honest with yourself to know that this is that day, because if you catch it in the beginning, then you can start the coping skills and it does not get or intensify to get to the point where you may need to have a PTSD diagnosis. So when your anxiety rises or you're feeling depressed or you're feeling like you know you're withdrawing or isolating more than usual then you know start by just you know of course doing some deep breathing trying to focus in on you know narrowing down what's going on with me you know what was the initial trigger did i feel like this yesterday did i feel like this this morning like where did it start you know so trying to refocus get those deep breathing skills in or techniques in and then you know of course your next step, if you still say, okay, I'm still feeling this way, what do I do next? Then, you know, going outside is always a quick fix, especially if the sun is out. We're here in Georgia, it's the summertime. If you go outside, take you a, a little small walk, you know, listen to the birds sing, finding a different avenue, just kind of like a different purpose. Like, we don't want to think about the job right now. We don't want to think about all the things we have to do when we get to work. We want to just think about ourselves. So deep breathing outside just trying to repurpose and refocus yourself and always of course think of positive things um, negativity is around us 24 7 so you know focusing in on you know what's positive what is positive in my life what do i you know what are my accomplishments looking like whatever the case may be and we all have positivity we just don't want to focus on it because negativity overshadows it but finding your positivity and being able to say okay and of course, if those things don't help, the next step is, of course, if you have a therapist or a certified peer specialist that you are close with, calling them to help them or have them help you get through the moment. And ACA, Stuart Stanley, any final thoughts as it relates to um, what employees can do to seek help from their employer? 
Well, I think one of the, the first things that we've heard here is be honest with yourself, but also I would hope that Douglas County is a place that, that our employees feel that they can come to their, their supervisors or their managers for support. And that's something that I hope that we are instilling in our managers and that um, is being resonated without, throughout our um, organization, that if you do have an issue, come, come to us for support so that we can support you and help direct you in the way of resources that can help you. Uh, we may not personally have those resources, but we can um, point you in the direction of the community services board or organizations like Mr. Thomas or, or therapists who can help you um, with what you have. So hopefully um, we, we, are, um, we have that type of organization where people feel like they're supported to do so um, and, and, and get that help. And I, I'd like to think that today is a testament to um, that commitment to creating forums and to creating an avenue for people to uh, find a, a space and a place to, um, to seek help. Uh, we can open the floor for a few questions if there are any. Uh, Wendy is walking around with the microphone. Yes, we have one question. I was wondering, is there anything that you can do if you're in an active situation? It's happening right now that can help you to mitigate some of the effects of whatever traumatic event is unfolding before you? Like in real time, are there any techniques or anything you can do to, to kind of help get you through it um, without becoming, without incurring such a large invisible wound? Me. Okay, so um, if you're in the moment, um, let's say if you're a 911 operator and you're in the moment, you have a call on and whatever the reason is, the call has triggered some emotions in you. Um, if you know that it's a trigger and you're trying not to be triggered further, then you want to take a step back. I mean, I know it's hard in most of our situations to push back, but you have to ask yourself, am I going to be effective? If I'm being triggered and I can't help the person that's in front of me because I can't help myself, then I need to take a step back and either tag somebody else in so you can go take a moment to yourself so you can work through it um, to get to the next point or take the next call. Or, you know, if you can't, then again, like Mr. Thomas said, sometimes you have to ask yourself, like, you know, is this my career path? Am I going to help the person that I need to help? You know, am I helping myself? Because if you're at work or if you're in the moment and you're being triggered and the trigger is, so your job, of course, if your first responder is your job, then you have to ask yourself if this is my career path because in the moment, you're still going to have to take a moment. <laughs> so there's no way you can keep going and say, okay, it'll pass or I can get through it. No, you have to take your moment to you know, actually calm yourself down and move forward. And on that note, I'd like to say we will be having our first responder panel coming up in just a minute to um, talk with our uh, directors ab about some of these real life, real time experiences and, and what the coping mechanisms are. Any other questions as we wrap this panel? Thank you all for your at attention to this and thank you all, um, thank, thank you to the panel for sharing. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you for being here. Um, I believe I've shared this with all of you, probably separately, but I have a, a lot of respect for the three of you sitting up there. Uh, you guys, are, you do a fantastic job for our county, <clears throat> and you are well respected by uh, your employees. So we're going to talk about this for just a moment. Each of your departments are different. <clears throat> Tell us a little bit what you, uh, what you have in place for your staff. Because each one of you see things differently. Some of you see it firsthand. Some of you hear about it over the call. What do you have in place for your employees who are experiencing PTSD? Anyone can take it. <laughs> Mark, first of all, I want to thank you for allowing me to be here. It's such a pleasure to come for the call that we're here for. It should, mental health should be every month 
should be mental health because it's a, it's a growing situation. And what I've done, starting in uh, 2021, you know, we see stuff nobody in this room sees or want to see. And you try to be tough because you're a police officer, but it's going to get you. It's going to wear you down. You might wait till you get home and start crying at the house by yourself. But eventually, what you've seen is going to play a part of your life. Some of this stuff will never leave you. So I put together a, a team, a 10-member team from my department. I went to each division, senior guys, and we picked one. I didn't, all the divisions come up with 10. Then we sent them to mental health training, all of them. Matter of fact, one of them is sitting in here now that's on that team. And, uh, you know, we really, really pay attention to our employees. That's what you have to do is pay attention, especially someone that's uh, going to have a mental problem. If he is a police officer, a deputy sheriff, it's kind of hard to get it out. And because uh, he thinks he's going to interfere with his job, he can't do his job. And in some cases, it will. If you focus more on your problem than you is your job, you have to have a clear-cut mind in the job that you've got and that you have. So it, it, sometimes it, 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 we have to remove weapons in some cases because I don't want you like that until you get straight. And this team, what I'm talking about, is one of the best teams I've ever seen because they're a close-knit team. They pay attention. And uh, how they started off, they, Matthew can tell you, but I'll tell you about it. They go to the captain. Captain go to the lieutenant. Lieutenant go to the sergeant, and they pay close attention. Look, if you see anybody, talk to them. If you can get them on a personal basis, and I try my best to share Meet everybody and treat them like family. I tell them that when I swear I'm in, we try to have a family or an in it place here. You can come in this door anytime you so desire. If you got problems with anything, you can come in this office. I may be able to help you. I may send you back to your lieutenant. But if you can get personal, they'll tell you things that they normally wouldn't tell you. And when you hire them, they might have had that on the cover for a long, long time. But this team will actually get with them and deal with them. And we also mess around, which was a great thing. We got a grant for this. So if one of my deputies, take like I'm going to use the name, one of my deputies got shot in not too long ago. Now, you know, that's going to be stressful. So what this team does through this grant, they will send his wife and him somewhere so it can clear his mind. Just Florida or wherever they choose to go, that team sponsor that bill, and it all comes through from a grant that we received through trying to help mental patients. Director Harley, I want to pick up where we left off on the last panel, which which was, what do you do in the moment? You mm -hmm. know, this is your job. You're, you're navigating. Um, you know, a stressful situation that's coming in to you or you're on the front lines of it. How do you navigate that? How do you center yourself in the moment? Excellent. Well, I like to start by saying that in a perfect world, uh, it would be advantageous to be able to uh, pass off a stressful 911 call that may be triggering uh, to you personally. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a realistic world, uh, due to staffing and everything else, sometimes you have to complete that call because there simply isn't anyone to pass that call off to. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, aside from that, uh, the Occupational Information Network, which is part of the United States Department of Labor, um, actually list out of 873 most stressful jobs, public safety telecommunicators ranks number eight. And so uh, that, is, that is unfortunately uh, a part of, of this job. The biggest thing about uh, 911 uh, in particular and the nuances to 911 with regards to 
uh, this public safety stream is that uh, there are certain nuances to it. And, and that is, there's no emotional recovery. And so with that, uh, imagine a story that you're the author of, but you don't see its completion. And then from that, you have to go right into another story. And so when, when folks call 911, of course, they're not calling uh, when things are going well in their lives. They're calling because something is going extremely wrong in their lives. And so um, I know that uh, Sheriff talked about uh, some of the things that are in place. And so for us, uh, we have debriefings. And so when, when there is uh, an, an incident, although you know, the sheriff's office is a partner agency and they also have their own dispatch that call started in 911. And so with that, that particular day in the incident that he discussed, we had a debriefing with everyone that was on shift uh, that day because they all played a role uh, in that call. Um, and so we have uh, some grounding things. So. Uh, when when it's an, a non-busy time, we have things like kinetic sand, we have coloring books, we have things that folks can just take their minds off of the job for just a little, a little bit, just a little bit. Um, and we also uh, make sure that, uh, like uh, Chief of Staff Stuart Stanley said, that we, we uh, quarterly uh, send out to our employees the information for the employee assistance uh, program, uh, as well as bringing people in just to talk about things that our operators go through. Because keep in mind that our operators come in and sometimes they have their own things going on personally in their own lives. And so uh, as 911 operators, uh, you're taught very early on that whatever you have going on personally, you have to check it at the door because you have to be present for our citizens and our visitors to Douglas County to ensure that we are providing the best possible service that we can, that we can provide. Uh, another thing that we are working on is a, um, a quiet room for our employees uh, so that they can have a space, no, te no televisions, uh, just a space just to decompress. And so that's where we are. So one of the one of the things that we we say is who who are the people that take care of the people? So uh, in emergency services in public safety, uh, people look at us and people think that we don't have lives. You know, we are there when when nine one one gets the call. Uh, nine one one sends it out to the sheriff's department, sends it out to the fire department. Uh, sends it out to uh, any other emergency services, and we are we are known to respond. We are going to show up, but a lot of people fail to understand, like uh, Director Harley and Sheriff Pound say, we have lives also. It actually starts with the uh, with the hiring process, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we have to thoroughly vet the individuals that come into our services to be able to take care of the people. But you look at this panel here, we are the people that try to help take care of the people. So in the fire department, we have a, we have a two-fold process uh, when, we, when we look at the, uh, the mental health of our, of our employees. We, uh, we work with a local, uh, a local agency that helps us talk about what's going on in our lives. You know, if we have an issue, uh, we have the local agency, the, the, uh, the Nickel Center, they, they talk to us. We have them on call. We can, you know, my, my, my cat died today, but yet I got to go out and, for the sake, for the sake of argument, go out and get a cat out of a tree, you know. Um, and behind that, we have, we have a critical incident stress debriefing. And so what we do is we, when we have those, those major incidents, uh, it's incumbent upon our supervisors to filter down and to really observe the individuals that work beneath us and just watch them. 
but it's incumbent upon the supervisor supervisors to watch them to see how it, how a certain incident affects them. Um, I go out on a lot of calls, and I don't get involved in a call. I just watch my employees and see how they are reacting to the situation. And if the one thing that I see that might bother me that looks like it's bothering them, I have to step in. And we have to train and teach our supervisors to notice these signs and to and and not to just sit back and 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 let it go because between the three of us uh our people are strong but sometimes uh even the strong ones need to need to vent need to uh get things off their chest because once again we are the people that take care of the people i think that's amazing um the way you phrase that because what I, what I hear here is also it's about being present, right? Um, you being present as a part of the work that your teams are doing and understanding and recognizing signs and symptoms. Um, are you able to, what, what sort of signs and symptoms are you able to recognize and say, you know what, I need to get a, a little more assistance for this person or maybe I need to bring in this resource for my team because I'm recognizing some, some pretty um, important signs and, and symptoms? Well, without, without being graphic, um, there's times where, like uh, last year, we responded to a uh, two-year-old drowning and we had we had some veteran firefighters on scene. Some of them were strong in handling, but we also have, uh, in my mind, we have children working for us. I have 18 year olds, 19 year olds, 20 year olds who have never been in any kind of emergency situation, who have never seen anything of this magnitude. And then all of a sudden they go through the training and we try to make the training as realistic as possible, but it's not that you don't really get that realism until you actually get there. And without speaking for Director Harley, we're, we're actually seeing it. Her people hear it. Mm -hmm. And they have to draw a picture in their head. And, you know, without speaking for the sheriff, even when his folk are there with us, you have all of our people involved in this thing. And once again, you have people who try to be strong, but you've got to have, you've got to have those supervisors who are experienced enough to recognize when enough is enough to say, regardless how a person is acting or how a person is walking around and doing certain things, you got to separate them for a minute and sit back and tell them, okay, take a breath and go have some type of focus time or some type of um, stress debriefing to get this off their chest because you live with this on a daily basis. And sometimes the symptoms develop over time, right? So um, if you have an employee who uh, ordinarily comes to work, comes to work on time, and they start to uh, sick out a lot, and it's not their, their regular uh, cadence with regards to the work, you have to be able to, to recognize that. Um, you also uh, have to be able to, to just uh, see the signs of when your employees are just saying, I have enough, or they're becoming mean, and they're not ordinarily a mean person. Um, you have to be able to look out for the signs and symptoms of burnout. Um, you know, we talk about PTSD, but sometimes there are some things that happen along the way before we get there. Um, and you have to be able to, to recognize those things. And we talked about presence. That's part of knowing your people. Uh, that's part of knowing each and every member of your staff so that you know that when there is something that is happening that is uncharacteristic of their normal behavior, that you have to step in and say, hey, are you okay? You know, what's going on? Come on into my office. Let's talk about it. And that circles back to what the sheriff said earlier, which was about being a family and really connecting with, with the people uh, on your teams. Um, and I want to go back to what you said, Chief Allen, which was um, the people who protect the people, the people who help the people. 
Um, you guys are not here by accident. You've worked really hard in your careers. You've seen a lot in your careers such that you have that experience to be able to recognize signs and symptoms, to be able to help the people. Um, what has sustained you um, along your journeys in, in, in public safety and seeing the things you've seen? Um, how have you sustain, sustained yourselves? How have you made it to the levels you've made it to? Um, how have you navigated some of the things you've seen? Sheriff, I'd like to start with you. When, it's a good question. You know, I've been in gun battle. I fought side by side. I shot, they shot, did all that. <laughs> and then it didn't bother me. But a child, it's gets me. I'm kind of like you say about recognizing the symptoms. It's been several times while I was in the midst of it, and I had to turn back. I can't take that. I can't do it. Like this particular call, somebody in this room may remember, put his, boy, put his nephew and his grandma in the car and burn them up in the car. I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't deal with it. I couldn't see that it, it, it get me, and, and you know, like I said, sometimes you get home, and I'm around, I cry my eyes out, sometimes I talk to the Lord about it, simply because we are human. We don't, like Chief Adams said, some folks think we super folk, we both take all that in, and don't ever think about it no more, it ain't like that. That constantly come back to you, and it's gonna forever come back. I still see that little child from time to time, as we speak today, I still see that. But you just got to be strong, and like she said, talk to somebody about that situation. Now, I always tell my wife, some of my family folks about it, and kind of like you said about that dark room. I get relieved from that. But as long as it ain't a child, it don't bother me. If it comes to a child, I'm going to turn it over to somebody else. But I'll still be there for support, but I can't deal with it. Have you navigated, Director Harley? So public safety is an interesting family. It, it really is an interesting family. Um, for me, my career journey was a, a little bit different. So I did a, a number of years in 911, and then I stepped away. Uh, but what I stepped away uh, to kind of aligned still. So I was the executive director of the Douglas County Task Force on Family Violence. Um, and we dealt with domestic violence, sexual assault, and I actually became the county's first civilian forensic interviewer working alongside uh, Sheriff Pounds' investigators on child sexual abuse and physical abuse cases, some of which I am still going to court for. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, along with Douglasville uh, Police Department and their detectives. So still aligned uh, in that way, but in that role, what I actually learned a lot about was trauma mm -hmm. and about mental health. And so coming back into 911 as the director, my lens is a little bit different mm -hmm. because the idea of mental health with regards to 911 employees uh, and wellness summits and all of these things is a fairly new concept uh, because you know, 911 was traditionally thought of, of well, they just, answer the, they just answer the phones and then they send the call to fire EMS and they send the call to law enforcement and so they're not necessarily affected. But that's just not true. And so um, that's pretty much how I have been able to, to navigate is to, to really understand that in this profession, we have a lot of employees, and this is not just Douglas County 911, this is 911 as a career that are sick in a seat. And so we have, to, we have to recognize that. So my preservation has been truly understanding what this work does, what it does for our citizens, but also what it does for our employees. So, so let me just say this. Um, People in public safety, people in emergency services are not immune to alcoholism. We're not immune to domestic violence. We're not immune to uh, any of the other things that, that afflict the rest of the community that we respond to. Uh, I've been doing this for, this is my 
going into my 36th year, I've lived in the county for 23 years. Uh, just like the gentleman, I did 21 years in the military. And some of the hardest things is uh, responding to emergencies in which you're, number one, dealing with people that you know, dealing with family members, dealing with coworkers. And unfortunately, I have, I've been a part of all three of those things. Um, so how do, how do I cope? It's been a, it's been a journey. It's, it's been something that I had to intrinsically build within myself because of my, my long years in doing this thing. Um, sometimes it's just sitting back watching a football game. Sometimes it's cutting my grass. Ironically, sometimes it's even sitting and listening to my, my radio. Uh, but it's something that uh, over time I, have to learn, I had to learn how to cope with. But that's me being uh, an old head. We're in a new generation now in which uh, people in our field have got to have that avenue in which they need a positive release in order to cope with the day-to-day -day stressors of what they see, what they hear, and what they respond to. And so uh, we're, we're, we're learning everybody this. We're teaching folk how to be uh, better able to cope with the, uh, the things that they're dealing with. For sure. <clears throat> One thing, Sheriff, that I, I, as we was talking about all this, you, you have to deal with the mental health of your employees, but also you have to deal with the mental health of those who are in your institution. Mm -hmm. What does your office do for those who come into your institution? Because we, we, this conversation came up I believe in one of our public safety committee meetings, and uh, your lieutenant colonel brought it, said that you know that there was roughly about 80 percent of people that's in your institution have some sort of mental disorder. So, what does what does your office do for those who are in your facility? We have uh, a mental health section in the jail. It's uh, third floor is really designed for mental health simply because. They is turning the jail into a mental hospital. And uh, the nurses is for me with that part of it. And, but my entire staff, they go through this training we call it, everybody in the room know what CIT is, which is the, uh, we go through that, we host it twice a year, just for the staff, for my staff, we host that twice a year for those, uh, for my employees, so they'll be familiar with what they need to do, what they need to tell the nurse. And it ain't no, we don't have a deputy for the third floor. Every employee that works in the jail may have to work that third floor. But they, they get the training through that CIT program, and uh, that's how we train them all to do that. And, and, and once again, Mark, Everybody can't do it. Right. Everybody can't be in law enforcement. Everybody can't be 911 operator. But those that can and does what I have, does such a super job. They will notify, you answer your question, they will notify the nurse that's on her, because the nurse on 24 7 in the jail. She's there. And when they have problems, that's how they get it to the nurse and let the mother folk deal with that. One of the things that I, well, it's a question I had, but Fire Chief already took my question, but, <clears throat> you know, I, I visited your burn center, and you had training going on that day, and you mentioned that you do your best to try to prepare these young men and women who are seeking a career in public safety. You do your best to try to make it as realistic as possible. I watched you know, those young men crawl through on their hands and knees in that burn tower as if they could, could not see, but they knew where they had to go to to accomplish their training. But there's a difference in that, but also running into a live burning building and you know somebody's in there. Or you're running in to a house where you know someone's got a gun 
and they're holding someone hostage. The emotions and stress I've never experienced, but I can only imagine how high that would be. You, you've already spoke about in regards to what you do for them at that moment, but how critical is it that when you see that emotion, how soon they get help, how soon do you, we respond to get them help? Because some people, like Ms. Harley said, you, you, everybody doesn't handle it the same. Everybody doesn't handle it the same. Some need attention quicker than others, and some will suppress it. So what is your what is your team what does this, each one of your teams do to make notice not only of that situation but how quickly you respond to getting them help? I think that comes with I think that comes with experience. We can train as hard as we can and make it as realistic as we can and it'd be fine in training. But it really doesn't take effect until the real thing happens. Um, and it just comes with it comes with experience. So when 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 I train my supervisors to recognize their their subordinates and and like Sheriff said, it's a family. You know, the the hardest thing about it is um, looking at we, we, we all all three of us our staffing is low. So the individuals that are working it are working it on a rotational basis. And so there's not enough break in time to, to get that, that uh, release, so to say. So they're seeing this all over the place. So it's, it's hard and it's, and it's a matter of just getting people to recognize when their subordinates are not acting right. Director, you wanna? The bottom line is we manage it as best we can. Uh, we, we, we work with what we have, and we do the best that we can with what, with what we have. Um, what, what I've come to know about Douglas County 911 is that our folks are really in tune with each other. They know each other. When, when I first uh, came on board as, as director, um, one of the first things that I noticed about this 911 center, I said, well, I'm here. And so after a year or two, my second year in now, uh, going into my third, I said, well, we go together now. <laughs> we go together. So they know me. I know them. We know our staff, and we know when things are off. We know when things are off. And so we, we, we don't bury our heads in the sand like we don't see it because the other part of things being off, and I know that both of my counterparts can attest to, th to this, is that when things are off and mistakes are made, there's, there's high scrutiny with public safety. There's high scrutiny with public safety. So we owe it to ourselves that we have to know, uh, and we have to we have to act. Sheriff, any? indeed. Any final thoughts on that, Sheriff? <laughs> yeah, she she really said it all. Mm -hmm. But it's a team, <laughs> and it's got to be on that team. Her, him, the commissioners, mm -hmm. everybody got to be on this team that you're talking about, and you really. Really, what I like about what the chief said, you really need to know your employees. You need, you really need to know them. And the only way you're gonna do that is they believe and trust in you. Now I had a lot of folks come to me and say, Sheriff, it just ain't for me. Mm -hmm. I can understand that because you can't take some of the things that public safety have to take. And I'd rather for it to be that way where you can, I can talk to them and he can say, you know, for me, I had that happen so many times, and I really appreciate him. I told him I appreciate him, and maybe they'll take, you know, maybe another position that you can handle, but out down the street, I just can't do it. So, as a whole, it's us three, we stay on the same team, in which we are, 
We're going to make the best thing Douglas County ever had, mental health wise and public safety. And as I listen to you, um, a couple of thoughts resonate. Um, experienced leadership matters. Compassionate leadership matters. matters. Mm -hmm. And so I thank you all for what you've brought to the table in all of those arenas. Uh, are there any questions for this panel before we wrap it? <laughs> oh, no, we got one. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, thank you for your service and, and everything that you do for Douglas County. And um, I do know your job is very, very detailed when it comes to managing your people. And you have a very experienced team to, that has been through a lot and know how to manage personnel. And you all have been working together for a long time. So you know how to, to um, really observe what's happening and pull them aside when something goes wrong. Here's some of our challenges. I work with a, a traffic control company. And, a lot of our young men and women, y'all know Georgia is a fire at will state. So a lot of these young men and women, they're losing jobs every day, moving back and forth and trying to figure it out. Uh, and they become a part of our problem because once they lose a job, they lose income. And now they start to go to the streets and do things that uh, are really just breaking the law. Most of our small businesses out here don't have the funding nor the knowledge because, you know, small businesses are popping up every day. And they don't have the funding or the knowledge to, to or, the, or just the skill set to be able to identify a lot of these problems that they're um, having with these and new, newly hired employees and a lot of the younger staff. And plus, they're underpaid. What are some suggestions that you think that we could really put in place to be able to assist a lot of these small businesses that have a lot of individuals with behavioral health and mental health problems? That's a loaded question. <laughs> Double bear, of course. <laughs> you want to go or you, you, y'all want me to? Go ahead. Y'all want me to take it? Take it. Okay. Okay, so um, with regards to small businesses, um, the, the biggest challenge is resources. And so it is connecting the small businesses with folks that house the resources. So I would say um, specifically for Douglas County, uh, tap into the resources. So we have the Community Services Board, we have the Douglas County Chamber, you know, and I think that it's important for an organization that deals with small businesses to, to house those resources, to be able to funnel those resources out uh, to the, because they're going, they're going to have the biggest voice uh, with regards to that. Um, and then, you know, as far as, as our young people, I can hire young folks as, 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 as young as 18. Right, but they have to be able to pass a background check. They have to be able to successfully go through a polygraph, a psychological examination, um, and some other assessments and things that we do in their criminal background matters. And also their drug use or not matters. Um, and I think that it's also important to bring the school system into that conversation as well. So you, you have, you have, there are resources available in the county. Um, I sometimes feel like with our resources, sometimes there's um, a silo component to how those resources are managed. But if we, if we begin collectively as a county to manage our resources better, and then to funnel those resources through the people that have the ability to widespread get them out to the public, I think that that can help. I hope that answered the question. And I'm going to be honest with you. These young kids just don't want to work no more. I'm sorry, but they just don't want to work. <laughs> Period. So is a tag along with what the director's talking about. It's resources out there that they don't even know about. They don't, never, they don't even use. 
Because <laughs> our little society is what we got going on. I call them the microwave society. Because they want everything quick, fast, and unhurried. And if they ain't making the money you spoke about earlier, that small business cannot afford to start you off $25 an hour. They can't afford that. But that's what they're looking for if they don't find it. Social media ain't nobody's friend. <laughs> nobody's friend. But once again, as a team, commissioners, us, they don't fit the slot that's open. Because you mentioned all that stuff you have to go through. That's the thing you got to go through to get with us. If you go out there to these small buildings, I don't know what their requirements are, what you got to have in order to be, be employed there. But uh, ours are so much different from that. But like I said, once again, we got to get the kind of change their mindset. You, when I started, you had to work up to that. When I started, there wasn't no money involved, but they don't look at that no more. They want that money. So, and they got to want the job. Okay. Okay. I'll piggyback off that one too, <clears throat> is owning a business that, again, they got to look out as is very clear as what we got sitting over there, leadership matters. Leadership matters. Not every single employer is going to have the main, same mindset. I prefer to lead by motivation opposed to lead by fear. So that's going to fall in into those young men and women that are going to know or want to know who they're going to work for. But I'd say leadership matters. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I would like to thank each and every one of you for taking the time today because I know you all have very busy schedules. <laughs> very busy schedules. Yeah, just a little bit. A little bit. 24 7. 24 <laughs> 7. But again, thank you for taking the time out to be, in, to be at this forum today. Thank you. Appreciate thank you for having us. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat>Okay, we're going to move on to our, our next panel <clears throat> in which we're going to have our Madam Corner, uh, Madam Corner is what I call her, but Corner Godwin. We have Mr. James Queen from our E911, I mean, sorry, emergency response. Used to be with E911, but he's now our emergency response. And then uh, Ms. Frankowski, who is over our animal control. We thank y'all for being here with us today. Um, as you've heard us talk about this mental forum, again, we're changing to you have completely different roles than the three before you. <clears throat> Tell us a little bit more about what your department, each of your departments sees and what you have to deal with that might cause issues or mental health issues for your employees. I think we, we should start with Madam Coroner because yes, we, Madam we Coroner. alluded to this <clears throat> earlier. I mean, by nature of the, the work you do, it is a, a job that deals with death constantly um how do you deal with that how do you navigate that and how do you help your teams navigate that um, first of all i want to thank you all for inviting me to come share on this forum um death is hard and you know you have different employees different personalities and all of that and too many deaths can get overwhelming for the employees and I try to get close to my employees so that I can know the employees and recognize the signs of mental illness. I had one employee and I, I try to read every report that comes in the office. And I noticed his reports was different. And then he started calling out. And one night after he left a call, he broke down and just left the whole county. He packed up, he left. Mm -hmm. And I, I spoke with him about it, but I have a psychotherapist at my, where well, she's not at the office, but she's available for, for the team. And they do, they go out, they go and speak with her when they're having issues. And I can agree with Corey uh, masking alcoholism because I've also had to deal with that in my office as well. And they come in 
happy, happy go lucky, you know, team player. And then all of a sudden, they, they just isolate themselves. And with this certain employee, he will go in the office and close his door. And so I'll go in and find out what's going on. But what happened when he left the county and I went to clean out his office, I found a big part of Patron in his drawer. And I would never have thought that he was doing that. But again, he was hiding. And he said it was a little too overwhelming for him. I had another employee, it's a young kid, and he came out on the call, and uh, the sheriff's department brought a tarp out there because the body was leaking. And when he got there, the body exploded. And he just came up to him, he said, I can't do it. And I have to respect him for that. Mm -hmm. And the sheriff was talking about the kid that uh, the two-year-old that got burnt in the car. That was my case, and it was also close to home for me. The sister to that two-year-old was at my house at the time. Mm -hmm. So it can, and I walked in the hospital on a call myself, and when I walked in, it was like my son, it looks like my son laying in that bed. His five-year-old brother shot him. They were playing with a gun. And Commissioner Ackeris, you know, you, be, you came from the coroner office, so you know the things that we see and the things that we encounter. But as, uh, as far as the help, we have, I have a, a minister. I have uh, Shavonda Dykes, surviving transition. And also a lot of people don't know on the back of your Blue Cross Blue Shield card, there's a number on the back for mental health, along with the county offering EAP. So if it's any other resources or anything that I can do to be a part of this mental health, I'm for it. Because the suicide rates are going up now. And it's young kids. It's not older people, it's young kids. We've had five this month. And we have more suicides than we have homicide. So we need the help. I wanted to move to Vanessa next because we, we talk about animal services and people don't always make that connection um, that there may be some challenges in the, in the mental health arena in the work you do. Help us understand what sort of challenges you deal with in this arena. So for our department, um, I think a lot of people seem to forget that there is a human element to what we do. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the times, and you know, uh, speaking with the coroner, you know, those suicides we end up responding to as well because there's a human animal element to it. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been on scenes where there's homicides, but there's an animal on the property. Mm -hmm. And we're often arriving at the same time, the fire department's arriving, the sheriff's departments, we're there along with them. Um, the stressors are not just animal stressors because there is that human element to it. We see the best and the worst of humanity, just like the deputies would, we, we see the best and worst. Um, you know, when we go out to scenes, you know, nobody prepares you for somebody that just put a live animal in an oven, you know, and you're having to deal with a family that's screaming. You know, nobody prepares you for the murders that we go out to or the suicides where they've also taken the life of their animals. You know, nobody prepares you for the hoarding cases where animals are not shot, they're executed and burnt. You know, we are often labeled as we just play with puppies and kittens, but it's not, that's about 1% of what we do. And oftentimes when we're out in the field, you're responding to that one call and you have 15, 20 minutes to basically comp uh, back it up in your back. You know, you're, you're filing away and then you're responding to the very next one. So for us, that, that it's hard to let people understand that it's not just animals because there is a human element to it and getting them to understand that, you know, we work with our partners daily. You know, we're right there with them, the coroner's office, the sheriff's departments, you know, E911. We face the exact same thing and the stressor for us is, and I'll, I'll, I'll give Commissioner Alcarez um, kudos all day long for inviting us to this table mm -hmm. because that helps us break that stigma of we just play with puppies and kittens all day. You know, we are first responders as well, and I 
that is what we're trying to get out there is that we really do see the work that everybody else does, but we're right there alongside with you. That's an important point because it's also about dispelling myths mm -hmm. um, yes. and stereotypes, yes. that sort of thing. Um, Director Queen, talk to us a little bit about EMA and and the the response that you have to make. Um, and usually yours is in the aftermath. You're you're on the front end planning and preparing for not if but when. And so when the when happens, what is that like for you and your team? Um, being an EMA, EMA um, there is actually a disconnect that's out there because we don't respond to the scene. Um, at least not normally. There are some things that we go out to. We'll go out with search and rescues. So we're going out there and we're helping the sheriff's department and the fire department and everyone look for this person that's missing um, and in many cases is going to be found deceased. Uh, so it can be trying knowing that you're going out here looking for someone and more than likely you're going to find a body, not the person that you were looking for. Um, there are um, many options that are available. Um, a lot of, because we're such a small department, um, a lot of it is based on personal preference. It's left up to the individual as far as, do you go see a therapist? Do you want to use the resources that are provided by the county? Um, those types of things. Um, but it's, it's a little different just because in fact it's more preparation than actual response for us. And then when we do get to the response phase, a lot of it is the coordination with the sheriff's department, the fire department, and all of the other um, entities here in the county so that we can coordinate that response as a single response. <clears throat> Going back, because Vanessa said something <clears throat> that you have to file it away and then move on. <clears throat> Panel Corner, I know that there's been times this is bringing us up that when I was working with the coroner's office, some things that you see things you can never unsee, never unsee the exploding body not to be graphic, but I've seen it quite a few times <clears throat> to where the deputies actually walked out. And I had to say, when I say deputies, I'm talking about the sheriff's deputies to where I had to say, well, Hey, I need help from someone you know, I can't do all this by myself, but I'll never forget when we had a, I had a gentleman step in front of a train in Lithia Springs. And for the North Folk Southern to tell me, I need you to get those certain parts out of the front of our train because we've got to keep this train moving. To turn right around to have to go to leave that call and go, and my biggest one was always, as the sheriff said, was the children. I, I felt that God gave me an ability to, I guess you can say compartmentalize everything, but it, when, when it was the kids <clears throat> is what got to me the most. And especially when you knew a parent did something to that kid. That was hard. But go, going back, you're in the, you, you get calls in the middle of the night. You're, you or your deputies are out there in the middle of the night you don't really have no one to talk to for hours. You can be out there, get that call 11 o'clock at night, turn around and get another one right behind it. And you've got to store that away and file it away until the next day. And there's nobody really for you to talk to in your department. So how important is it for you, for your employees or staff to come to you as soon as possible to let you know I'm having, you know, I'm having issues. I need to speak with someone. That's very important to me because I know how I feel and what I face when I go out there. So if I'm feeling this way, I'm quite sure my, my employees are feeling the same way. And as quick as they can get to me, I'm available for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, it's a sad situation because that's just a small group of us. And if we're out there at night and then we have to process it when we get to the office, there's no one there we can talk to. A lot of times your spouse or whomever you live with, they can't relate 
to what you just seen or what you are going through. So we have what we call self-care, and every quarter we come together and do mock trainings, and I try to take the employees out so we can just get away for a minute. Um, I wanted a quiet room in my new building, but didn't make it. But um, yes, we, and like I say, Surviving Transition is on board <clears throat> for the office, and they have her contact information, and they do reach out to her. There's, uh, you know, when you think of these jobs as public safety, you think of it as, oh, I'm going to go put on a badge. I'm going to go do this. No one ever understands the bad parts of the job. You know, not going to lie, when I become a deputy coroner, I thought, oh, that, that would be neat. But to turn right around and to realize how serious it is, or to come work for animal control, you get that thought, I am going to just go play with puppies, and that just will be my job. But it turns into something completely different. What would be your suggestion, or how do you try to prepare those that you're looking to, to employ in your departments? How do you try to prepare them for what they might see? Um, so for animal services, it used to be you really want to work with animals. But that goes that stigma, we play the puppies and kittens all day. You actually have to have a really big passion for doing this. And what we try to do is when we have people that interview with us or potentially want to get into this field, if, even if it's career days, uh, when we got to the schools, it is a lot of hard work. You know, the thing that we really capture is you need to have a life outside of your job. You need to have a hobby. That's your way to de-stress, decompress. You have to have a support system. If you don't have your support system, even through work, you know, you're, you're going to compartmentalize things and it's going to rear its ugly head at some point. Um, and for people trying to get into this field, again, it is, it is a compassion, it is a passion that you want to do but it is a life balance. They've got to be able to, I, I when starting off for me, I started off 27 years ago and I was gung ho, get into it. And that's great, but you can burn yourself out as well. And so pacing yourself, finding a hobby, finding something outside of your job to keep you occupied and de-stress is one of the biggest things for us. I'm wondering also if education and awareness um, is an important component in the work you do um, in mitigating some of the, the instances you might have to respond to. You, you mentioned high suicide rates. Um, you mentioned, you know, hoarding or, you know, people not caring for animals well. Um, you mentioned some of the, the scenes you respond to, and I know preparedness is, is a key in the work you do. Um, is awareness and education an important component of the work you do? And, and if so, why and how? Start with you, Vanessa, or Corner. Edu <clears throat> education is very important when it comes to mental awareness and to the job. Mm -hmm. uh, we have annual training for uh, deputy coroner, well, coroners and service training, that's what it's called. And we also seek outside training as well. But out of all of this training, they never mention mental illness. And that's something that needs to be changed. So, and we try to, a lot of people think, okay, the coroner's body snatcher. You know, they just come and get the bad, get the body put in the bag and go on about the business, but it goes beyond that. Mm -hmm. Because at the same time, when we get these bodies, we have to investigate the body. We have to turn the bodies over. We have to take pictures of the body. We have to examine the body. But the people on the outside don't see this. Whether he, his skin, he has skin slivage or whatever the case may be, decomposed, we still have to examine that body. And that can put a lot of stress on, on someone. And it goes, and we take the body to the office, but at the same time, right now, we don't have the space to examine the bodies if we have inclement weather. Mm -hmm. 
but we're doing the best that we can with what we have. Awareness, preparation, is that helpful for our community? During A the lot time? of it is dealing with um, when we're doing all the prep stuff, when we're creating all of these plans, there is stress that's involved in that because you have to think about the fact that you're looking out for the entire county. You're looking out for a whole community. Um, and your plans may impact how that looks. Um, so there's stress involved with that. And then you're never prepared once you're out on the scene. Um, we don't have the opportunity to go out and do some of the training that the sheriff's department and the fire department do. Um, so we don't necessarily have that luxury, I would say, when it comes to going out on a search and rescue or a search and recovery. Um, and with Douglas County having the dive team, the body recoveries that go on from lakes around the area, um, it can be very stressing and very trying on the individuals. But you do the work anyway. Yeah, that you do. Mm -hmm. what, what keeps you drawn to the work? knowing that you will make a difference eventually. Going to, uh, I wanted to bring something up that was absolutely profound to me that I know that my colleagues will share, is that in, our, in the animal welfare world, um, the suicide rate is four times higher than the, natural, than the national average, only to be shared by sheriff's deputies, police officers, and firefighters. And so that is so prevalent for what we do and making sure that the community understands that mental health is a huge factor for public safety officers in any form or fashion, whether it's dispatch, whether it's the coroner's office, whether it's planning, it's, it's huge for them. Um, having the community and our peers understand that mental health, it doesn't always show its face in the obvious ways. Um, but it's just like, you know, others were saying for us, you notice your people and if they're calling out or somebody just randomly snaps at you, you need to pull them aside and see if you're okay. It's getting to know your people for us. It's a work family. Uh, we know each other's in and out just because we work so closely together and focusing on taking that five minutes to say, are you doing okay today? Mm -hmm. Is there something I can help you with? Is there anything we have not touched on that you think is important for public awareness, uh, for citizens to know about the work you do um, and how to support you in that? I got, I got one. Mm -hmm. just, I'm just sorry not to interrupt, but each of you, just listen to each of you, you not only deal with your employees' women or health, but each of you in some sort of way also, you're a therapist a lot of, those that you're dealing with. <clears throat> Animals can be just like family to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Families are looking at you to find their loved one. And you are leaving with someone's loved one. I'll never, one of the things I'll share is I'll never forget when a child died and the mother couldn't understand why I couldn't allow her to hold her baby before I left with it. But it was part of the investigation. You can't do that. But they call you for days on end, want to know about their loved one. They call you at days on end, want to know about their pet. They call you if you still haven't found their loved one. What do you do for those citizens who live in our county, those families that we serve? What do you do for them? Or do you provide them with resources for their mental health? I provide resources. And I, I let them know that I have a, a psychotherapist and I offer them the information. For, or I will have my chaplain, he would reach out to them as well. And I never forget a couple of months ago, one of the ladies, her husband passed, it's an older uh, couple, and she called me back and thanked me. She said, I don't know what I would have done because it's just me and him. It was just me and him, and we just moved here to Georgia. So I think that's very important, 
And I also reach back out to the families after the funeral just to check on them and see where they are. Because when I first went in office, they had, at that time, they had the interns, and the interns were with the commissioners. And one of the uh, boys that was there, young men, he came to my office. He said, I remember when my father died. He said, y'all had him here. He said, my mom and I was in the house a whole month and never spoke to each other. He said, I thought about killing myself. And when he told me that, that's when this mental illness, that's when I said, no, we got to do something about this. Because this is a 16, 17-year-old child coming to you, telling you what they went through after his daddy died. So I'm on, I'm on board for anything you might have. When it comes to dealing with the family members, when you're specifically doing searches, um, there's lots of help available in the community that we try to point them in the direction of and just provide them with the reassurance that the, the search isn't going to stop just because we haven't found some, something yet. Um, there will always continue to be a search. Um, even in cases where it may become a cold case for the police department or the sheriff's department, there's always going to be some type of search going on until they are able to get that closure. And for us, is when it has the human animal element in it, you know, we partner with you know the sheriff's department, the coroner's department, um, uh, E911, and whatnot to provide those services. Um, when it's pet specific, uh, we offer pet counseling through the shelter. Um, you know, we also offer what you would call like a therapy. Um, animal to go ahead and help you know if they want to come hang out with us for a few hours you know deal with an animal perfect um, there's not much that we have animal related in this field to provide therapy when it comes to traumatic experiences um, outside of what we create so I don't know if there are any uh, questions at this point is there a question uh, yeah there is a question so what advice would you give for a public safety employee who's experiencing burnout, but they really would like to stay in, this, in their profession? I will have them to go to counseling because if they want to continue and they burnt out, they're not going to perform as well as they would if they had help. I would say talk with your supervisors. Make them aware of the situation. Um, if they're aware, they can help you more. And I'm sure that they will be more than happy to help you with whatever resources for mental health are available to you. That would be the first step in making sure that you stay on the path that you're wanting to stay on, even though you're starting to get burned out. And mine would just be have that work-life balance um, bringing in your supervisors, your bosses, seeking the EAP, but having that work-life balance because in the end of the day, if you don't take care of yourself, you're not good for anybody else. And I know this is, um, as we begin to, to wrap this panel, um, this is heavy work. Um, it can sometimes be dark work from what I'm hearing, but it seems to me that you really are the light for a lot of people um, in navigating these dark and trying and challenging times. Um, you don't come by this work by accident. Um, you, you talked about passion and commitment um, and a willingness to do the work and not everybody is willing and not everybody is capable. Um, so we thank you for the jobs you do, um, the, the work you do on behalf of the citizens of this county. Um, and I'd like to thank you for, for sharing um, a bit of your stories, um, a bit of your time today, uh, in hopes that it helps someone um, navigate um, challenges in their work lives, challenges at home. Um, I think it begins with the conversation. And I want to thank you, Vice Chair Alcarez, for having the forethought to bring this community together specifically to, um, to discuss this very important issue. I mean, 
the month calls for it is Mental Health Awareness Month, um, but the work calls for it beyond this month on an everyday basis that we all are in tuned and aware and committed um, to bringing awareness and, and light to the situation. So thank you for the conversation. Well, I can't take all the credit. I got to <laughs> thank Wendy Cottle. She came to me and we, we began this conversation in regards to uh, about this month mm -hmm. and just about some ideas. And so when we got on this idea of having our public safety into everyone to come in and our special guest, um, it, it was very important. You know, I think it, it's important for our community to see that what they have to deal with on a daily basis. It's not just going and putting out a brush fire. It's not just responding to someone who's need to be transported to hospital for some medical reason. Or it, it, it's a lot more that they have to go through that a lot of people just don't, don't understand. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not, you know, having worked in that field and alongside of some of them out there in the middle of the night, I see how tough it can be. And I want to thank all of you, as I did with others, for taking the time to be here today to give a little insight into what each of your departments do and, and what you have to go through to serve the citizens of our county. Amen. And so this is where we'll leave it. Um, but we know that the conversation continues. And I think that's an important um, starting point um, to to have an outlet uh, for conversation, for community, um, to at least begin the, the, the awareness um, that is connected to this very important issue. Thank you all for, for bringing your insight, your time, your experience, um, for all of us to share and to, and to marinate on as we um, move forward for Mental Health Awareness Month and beyond. Thank you all for watching.